Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion for him, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called, out, called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me back. It's great to be back and to see you all again. Warren has asked me to briefly talk about cards from Africa. Um, hands up if you can remember anything about cards from Africa, if you remember me coming a couple of years ago. Okay, so about half or a third of you. Um, I lived in Rwanda in East Africa for six years, and during that time I helped people start up a number of Christ-centered businesses. So they were ordinary businesses where uh, they were profit-making, but the aim was not to make lots of profit and money. The aim was to um, see Jesus glorified and... and um, honor God in those businesses. And the very first business, so one that's particularly close to my heart, is a business called Cards from Africa. Um, it employs young people who are orphans aged 18 to 25 and are looking after younger brothers and sisters. And they make their own paper and turn that paper into greeting cards. Um, it takes about half an hour to make one card. And um, we started off with 80 pounds of investment and one card maker and this year is our 10th year and we're about to employ our 100th employee full-time so we're about 95 at the moment um, and the cards are sold in about 15 countries around the world so very exciting uh, two weeks ago we had an order of 5,000 cards from Belgium and we've had some distributors in Austria and Finland interested so we're gradually growing and, um, and that is giving lots of work to um, the guys out in Rwanda and I brought some with me, so if you're interested to see some of the cards or take away a catalogue, then do pop by um, in the hall after you've grabbed your tea and coffee and have a look. Um, some other news that may be of interest to you about Cards from Africa 
is that um, about a year ago, we started employing someone called Timothy, who works part-time for the Anglican Diocese in Kigali, and now part-time for us in, in Kigali as well, as an entrepreneurial development worker. So our card makers come and stay with us for five years. We say to them, we'll give you five years of guaranteed employment. And during that period, we want to train you um, in a lot of different things. So every morning, we have sort of half an hour to 45 minutes of devotion. And each week, they go through different subjects. Sometimes they could be about spiritual issues, like what does it mean to love my neighbor or forgive someone? And sometimes they're about practical healthcare issues, like sex education or malaria and teaching them about things that um, many of them have missed out on because most of our card makers haven't even finished primary school um, because they ended up having to look after their brothers and sisters and, and with drawings from school. Well, Timothy, who's our entrepreneurial development worker, works alongside them in writing business plans and helping them save from the earnings they get because they get paid more than what they need to live on, um, which enables them to save. So none of our card makers come with a bank account, but that's... We only pay them by bank transfer, so they have to open one up. Um, and that's good for them because it means they don't go home with cash in their hand, uh, where the temptation would be to spend it quickly uh, or have neighbors who are in need to give it to. Um, so they um, come up with business ideas, and his role is to help them make that into a reality. So about a third, between a third and a half of our staff have now got businesses on the run. Little businesses, uh, some of them are growing. Um, but then that is enabling them to employ other people and to generate more income and gradually changing their community. So it's very exciting what God is doing uh, in the lives of our card makers. And we've seen, um, I think it's about 80 become Christians um, since we started um, 10 years ago. So um, we give God all the honor and glory he deserves. It was his idea uh, that popped into, it was him that gave me the idea uh, during a time of prayer and research. Um, and so I don't take any of the credit whatsoever. It was very much God all the way through it. And we've been on our knees many of the time when we've not had orders come in. Uh, one of my favorite moments was when the manager came to me on one Friday and said, Chris, it was a Friday morning, 9 o'clock, and he said, we've got no money in the bank, and everyone needs to get paid by the end of today. And, um, and it was a fair amount of money. I think we were employing about 15 people at the time. And um, he said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I've got no money. Um, we're just going to have to pray like George Muller did. So we got on our knees and we spent about an hour praying and reminding God that it was his business and that if he wanted it to keep going, he was going to have to provide. And um, by 12 o'clock that day, we had had an order that was a, one of the largest orders we'd ever had. And what was amazing, which was very rare for us at that time, was that they were paying up front for the order. And that kept us going for another month. And by that time, we were okay and we kept on going. So... Um, you know, God does hear our prayers and he does answer and he cares very much and if he has blessed you or ordained you as to do something then he will equip you and will never fail you. So that's Cards from Africa. Um, I'm going to speak this morning on uh, asking you a question, are you a servant or a son? And um, hopefully we will get some things coming up behind me. Um, I've learned a lot about law and grace since I last preached here. I could talk for months about the subject, but Warner has told me that I've only got two hours for this sermon, so um, I'll just have to give you the main points. Um, so are you a servant or a son? Now when I say son, I'm not just talking to the men and the, um, the males in this congregation. I mean are you a servant or a child? But a child doesn't begin with the letter S, and as you know all good sermons have to begin with letters that are the same. I asked for the parable of the prodigal son, which I think is best called the forgiving father, to be read this morning because it's a wonderful illustration of law and grace, law and grace summarized in one story. But before I get stuck into this, I just want to unpack the parable a bit. First of all, the son says to his father, give me my share of the inheritance. Now we're familiar with that. But in Jewish culture, basically what the son was saying to his father was, I wish you were dead, I just want your money. Now, I don't know about you, I don't have any children, but if you have children and you can imagine one of your children saying that to you, it would be a very, very painful thing to hear, especially if you really loved your child. For your child to come up to you and say, I, I really don't want to be with you, 
I don't want to spend time with you. I just want your money. Give it to me. And that's exactly what happened here. A very painful start to the story. And the people who were listening to Jesus at the time must have gasped when he said that. And he went away and he squandered all of this money. All of this money that his father had spent his life earning and building up um, and, and taking care of as a good steward. He went away and he squandered it on prostitutes, on bad music and food and all kinds of things. And, um, and it says that he came to his senses. He came to his senses whilst he was feeding pigs and thinking, you know, even my father's servants will feed better than these pigs. What am I doing here? He came to his senses. And so he turned back. He turned away from this land that he was in and he said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned, I'm sorry for what I've done. And started to think about those words that he was going to say as a way of saying, I'm sorry I wished you were dead. I'm sorry I've ruined uh, my chances, but uh, would you at least consider taking me to be one of my servants? He had no place to stand. It would have been perfectly understandable for his father to have said, no, I can't forgive you. I can't do this. Uh, or not even come into t contact with him, but tell some of his other servants, tell him to get off my land. I don't want to see him again. But do you know one of the, my favorite passages in the whole Bible is the next bit. As the son came to his senses and turned around and started going back to his father, it says that his father, whilst his son was a long way off, saw him. Now just think about that. Think about what that means. It means that his father was looking out for him, looking out and longing for him to come back. Even though he had basically said, I wish you were dead, I just want your money. His father was still filled with an overwhelming love and desire for a relationship with his son. And so he waited for him, waited and watched, day and night. And as he saw his son come over the hill from a long way off, he didn't start tapping his finger, say, you wait till he comes back, then I'll teach him. It says he ran. He ran to him with open arms, utterly delighted, completely overwhelmed with joy that his son had decided to come back. And as his son started saying, Lord, I'm sorry, Father, I'm sorry, what a mess I've made, his father interrupted him and said, let's celebrate. You've come back. I'm so happy. This is an amazing day. And he threw a party, and not just any party, a really big party. But it doesn't end there, because there's another twist. The son who didn't say to his father, I wish you were dead, but who had stayed at home loyal and working hard, became quite bitter, because he knew what his brother had done and was very, very upset and bitter that his father was celebrating his son, his, his, um, his brother's return. And yet he had been there all the time and he said, you didn't even give me a goat. And now this son of yours, this brother of mine, has, who wished you were dead and has squandered it on prostitutes and wasted all that inheritance and you've gone and killed a fattened calf and put a ring on his finger and the best robe and he was very angry and he refused to go in and celebrate with the party. Well, this story illustrates two systems that we use to try to gain acceptance, acceptance from God. So hold with me on the next bit because there's a lot of information on the next slide. There's the law system and the grace system. The law system says that it's based on the achieving by self-effort of certain standards. The son who stayed behind is a little bit like that. But the grace system says is based on receiving by faith what God did to us in Christ. 
The law system is based on the performance of my fleshly techniques, what I can do in my own strength, what I'm capable of. I stayed at home. I was loyal. I worked hard for you day and night. The grace system is based on being righteous in my spirit. The law system is focused, is always on me and what I have done. The grace system is always on God and what he is doing. So the oldest son who stayed back, look at me, I've done hard, I've worked hard for you. The youngest son realized he had no grounds for saying, look at what I've done, because what he had done was utterly terrible. It was the worst thing he possibly could have done. So he knew it was all about his father and the grace of his father. The law system behavior equals being, but the grace system is being produces behavior. I'll unpack a little bit of this in a bit. The law system produces self-righteousness, but the grace system produces faith righteousness. So looking at the parable of the lost son, you can see that the youngest son realized he had fallen so short. He had nothing of his own efforts left to cling to. He was not worthy to be called his father's son. But the oldest son, who had wished his father was dead, who had not wished his father was dead, sorry, but instead had remained loyal at home and faithful and working hard, he was still trying to gain his father's acceptance. His focus was on his efforts instead of simply enjoying his father's unconditional love in a relationship, which he could have had whenever he wanted. His father said, you're always with me. But he wasn't enjoying that relationship. He was trying to gain his father's acceptance by work. And that's not how his father w was working. That's not how his father is. Often what stops us accepting this outrageous grace that God extends to us is simply because we struggle in accepting our acceptance. We struggle to accept our acceptance. I need to know that I'm 100% acceptable in Christ because I am in Christ and Christ is in me. Does God accept me when I sin? Yes. Paul tells us that everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. So God accepts you when you sin, but do you accept you when you sin? Or do you condemn yourself? And instead of doing the right thing of coming to your senses, turning around as the prodigal did and returning to him and confessing, do you stay in your pig pen feeling sorry for yourself? Or are you like the older son who tries to work harder by your own efforts instead of having a relationship with God? I'm going to play you a song by Aaron Keyes called You're Not Guilty Anymore. Listen. Imagine that this is your heavenly father speaking to you, just like the, the story that we've heard. Guilty anymore. You're not. 
song wonderful we're not guilty anymore for those who have put their hope in Jesus and who are believing in him and trusting him and following him when our father looks on us he doesn't see the sin in our lives anymore because Jesus has taken that away and so he sees us as pure and spotless and holy he doesn't see us with all the sin and the rubbish in our lives our Father is so generous in his forgiveness. I want you to close your eyes whilst I read these questions out. Did you notice how I freely gave to my younger son his share, even though I knew he would waste it on wine, cheap women and bad songs? Haven't you realized that my capacity to give far outweighs your ability to waste what I give you? Or are you like my older son who stayed at home and yet never really enjoyed the benefits of living in and with me? Will you believe me when I tell you that it's not your work in the field that is most important to me? I have enough servants for that. My invitation is the same no matter which son you are. It's your party I'm putting on for you, but I won't start it without you. It's a relationship with you that I long for. Let me give you an example. You can open your eyes now. Let me give you an example of how outrageous his generosity and forgiveness is using donuts. Because I love donuts, and I was very pleased when Moira served up some donuts last night. Um, she, she's obviously found one of my weaknesses. I've got a very sweet tooth. And um, anyway, that was fantastic. There was this guy, and he was walking along, 
uh, in a park, and he saw this offer of five donuts for two pounds. He thought, that sounds too good to resist. And so he went and bought five donuts. They put them in a bag, and he went and sat down at a bench, put his bag down on the ground, unwrapped the bag, took out one of these nice hot donuts, wrapped up the bag, and tucked into it. He noticed there was a man sitting opposite him. And he smiled, and the man smiled back. And then to his astonishment, the man sitting opposite him opened up the bag, took out one of his donuts, closed the bag up, and started tucking into it. And this man was incredulous. He thought, who does he think he is? That's my donuts he's just taking. And so he unwrapped his bag, and having quickly stuffed that first donut in, and took out another donut, this time staring a little bit aggressively at the man opposite him, and rolled it back up. But the man opposite just smiled sweetly, and as he had finished his first donut, reached across and opened up the bag and took out his second donut and closed the bag and rolled it up. And uh, this time the man was really quite furious, really, and, and he sort of reached across and pulled the right bag right close to him and he opened up the bag and he was still eating his second donut, but he didn't care. He took out the third donut and he, he was stuffing it in. And it was only as he was stuffing in his third donut, he noticed to his left his bag of donuts. And he had been taking from this man's bag of donuts. That's what our Heavenly Father is like with us. He delights in showing grace and mercy and generosity in his forgiveness to us. Whilst he was a long way off, his Father ran to him. He wasn't, he wasn't slow in extending forgiveness. He was quick. All that um, lost son needed to do was come to his senses and turn around. That's all he needed to do. He didn't need to work for years and earn his way. He just needs to come to his senses. Your take-home phrase for today is, it's not what we do that determines who we are, but who we are that determines what we do. I'm going to read out the difference between a servant and a son's perspective on his heavenly father. And I want you to ask yourself which one, which one rings true with you best. The servant is accepted and appreciated on the basis of what he does, but the child is accepted and appreciated on the basis of who they are. The servant starts the day anxious and worried, wondering if his work will really please his master. The child rests in the secure love of their family. The servant is accepted because of his productivity and performance. The child belongs because of his position as a person. At the end of the day, the servant has peace of mind only if he is sure he has proven his worth by his work. The next morning, his anxiety begins again. The child can be secure all day and know that tomorrow won't change his status. When a servant fails, his whole position is at stake. He might lose his job. But when a child fails, he will be grieved because he has hurt his parents, and he will understand that correction and discipline comes from loving kindness. He does not fear punishment, though, and he is not afraid of being thrown out. His basic confidence is in his belonging and being loved, and his performance does not change the stability of his position. To end, then, in this journey of life that we're all on, the more we realize that we're children of God first and foremost, the easier it becomes to return to our Heavenly Father each time we've realized we've messed up the easier it becomes for us to accept that he loves us and accepts us and welcomes us just as we are. We don't have to become someone just as we are. He accepts us. The easier it becomes for us to accept that what Jesus has done on the cross 2,000 years ago has paid for all of our sin and we're not guilty anymore. We still sin but we sin as a saint with all the sadness and inappropriateness of it. Knowing we are his children and we belong to him makes it easier for us to live in the freedom of his forgiveness. And that in turn 
helps us fall deeper in love with him, our truly amazing father.